Hey you guys, uh, thanks for joining us again. Wanted to do a video today on how to do a long arm splint, or as it's otherwise called, a posterior elbow splint. Did a class just a couple days ago at a, at a nearby hospital a few towns over. Uh, shout out to Uvalde Memorial Hospital. Thank you for having me out, and uh, thank you for everybody who attended the class. One of the nurses that attended the class pointed out to me as she had she had gone through the channel and, and looked at most of the videos that in the 70 videos that we have, we had yet to do a long arm splint uh, video. So we're gonna go ahead and do a long arm splint. We're gonna divide it into two parts. We're gonna do the long arm splint and how to make it with all the materials you see here. And then part two will be how to add to the long arm splint, how to add a sugar tong. And that'll be the two, the second part of the video. Uh, just because there are some providers that will start with the long arm splint, they'll look at your work and then they'll go back and say, you know what, let's go ahead and add a sugar tong to it. Uh, so we'll talk about that in part two. Right now, this is part one, let's go ahead and get right into it. So as you guys have seen in the, in the multiple, multiple other videos in the past, um, you see me do a full length sleeve um, as I'm doing, as I'm getting started on the splint or the cast. This particular time I'm doing two parts just because I'm working with an adult arm. So you'll see as I do my part here, instead of having one continuous one and cutting away the wrinkles, I'm doing two separate sleeves to, to serve the same purpose. So we'll go ahead and get them in position the best they can, knowing that in real life, uh, our patient would of course be injured and they, they'll be probably limited as to what they can do, but right now we have a very cooperative patient. I am gonna start the hand and the wrist with two inch padding, and then as I work my way to the length of the long bones, I'll work with the three inch padding. So you'll see me do that as I go, and we'll go ahead and fast forward through all that since you guys have seen that so many times. So as you start getting to where the bend is, if the patient is willing to, you can have them bring their arm up and with their opposing hand, you can have them count, hold the counterweight. That will keep them in the right angle position so you can do your work and you're not having to tie up one of your hands holding here. If it's a child instead of an adult, you can have the parent hold right here. If, even if they have an injury, whether it's, it's a radius ulna, a supracondylar, a distal humerus, a majority of the time they can raise their elbow from the shoulder without it causing them too much discomfort. Let me go ahead and do the long portion here with three inch, a little bit more three inch here, and then right in here in the groove, you'll see me switch back to a two inch so it's not all bunched up in there. When you're working with an adult or when you're working with somebody who has a very very bony elbow you can do the exact same thing that we do when we're working with the heels you can take some strips and you can make extra strips around the elbow like so with the padding or if you feel more comfortable you can do horizontal strips and what this does 
is it reinforces the padding on the elbow without making a bunch of buildup right here, so you still get your nice right angle. And then when you come back to check, let's say for example this was uh, an olecranon or a, uh, a supracondylar type fracture, you come back and you tap on it, and if you don't feel any bony prominences, then you're all set. And then you go on and you do your bumpers like we've always done. Right, you guys so I went ahead and measured out a strip of orthoblast that's what we're going to use today to make this splint you can make this splint out of orthoblast out of plaster out of whatever you want to make it out of plaster rolls plaster splints this particular thing uh, and you guys have all seen it before it's orthoblast if you were to open the sleeve there are strips of fiberglass in here you notice that I cut a little crescent shape there so that there wouldn't be any corners rubbing past the borders of the stocking at the, the built-in sock. I did that on both ends. So you can see, I trimmed it back about a quarter inch from the sock, and I, I cut the little, the little angles there. Another way of doing this too, which you saw in other videos, is you can stretch out the sock. You can literally stretch it out past the fiberglass so that you never have to worry about the fiberglass making contact with the skin. And then another thing too you can always do is you can always fold it over. Some people will fold it over like this, and they'll tape this, that's why I had the tape on the counter. They'll tape that and they'll create a nice little bumper there. Completely, completely acceptable. We come over to the sink. There's a lot of ways to activate this. Some people will, be, will ask me in class, do you have to wet it? You don't have to wet it. If I just sit it out, just like so, if I just sit it out and let it dry, if we come back and visit this, this little piece here at the end of the video, this thing will be as hard as a piece of board. So it is activated just by the moisture in the air. But if you want to enhance the activation and make it go faster, you wet it. Two more common questions. Does the amount of water and does the temperature of water make a difference? And the answer is yes to both questions. If you use a copious amount of water, it's gonna set up quicker. But remember, any water you put in there, if you hold it up and it's dripping water, you haven't removed all of the excess water yet. You should be able to hold it up without it dripping a, a copious amount of water. One or two little drops is fine. The second question, the temperature of the water. You should always use room temperature water, never use hot water. Some people will, will want to use hot water because it sets up faster and they want to get it done very quickly. You have to remember it's an exothermic reaction and if you use very, very hot water, it's going to actually overheat and it's going to make the patient uncomfortable besides the fact that it's going to set up faster. Some people will dip it in a bucket of water. Some people will actually remove the whole strip of fiberglass, wet it and stick it back in the sleeve because it has two sided tape. You can stick it back together and that's fine. Just remember any amount of water that you put in it, you have to remove the majority of that water so that it doesn't soak through the cotton padding. In my particular video that we're making at this moment, I want you to, I want you to see something here. I am going to put that just a little bit more than a bead of water, and I'm only going to wet one side of it. Just like that. And that is it. That is all you need. You can see the bead of water that I just did. I'm going to lay it down. I'm going to massage the water into the one side that I wet. I did not wet both sides. Then, I'll just take a couple of tissues. If you have a towel handy, that's fine. Some people will tip, they'll get a towel and they'll roll it, they'll roll the, the material into the towel and they'll wring out the excess water and that's fine, that's acceptable. Because I only wet one side and I still have a dry side, all I need to do is just dab this dry. That's all I need to do is just dab it dry. And then what I'm gonna do I'm gonna place the dry side up against the cotton, which I'm gonna do next. So we're gonna come at the patient with the fiberglass that 
I'm placing the dry side up against the cotton, not the wet side. And there's a couple of ways you can do this. If you're working alone, have the patient, or if you're working with the kids, have the patient's parents help you. Forget about this right here for now. You got, you got some time, you got about five minutes. Have the patient or the parents or whoever hold it, for lack of a better term, hold it like a soft taco shell, just nice and soft. Nice and soft, no big finger indentions, no heavy hands. And then while they're holding it, use the stockinette as your helper. Up here at the tip of the pointer finger, cut a hole. Cut a hole. And watch this, you guys, watch this. You just now gave yourself a whole nother helping hand. Go ahead and slide your hand down for me. There you go, slide it down, slide it down. Now, go ahead and bring your hand back up. There you go, you can relax, soft, soft, soft. Now, if he lets go, go, the stocky net is doing all the work for you. So watch this. Don't worry about holding. No, you're fine, you're fine. Come on over here, a little bit. Bend a little bit for me, thank you, sir. And do me a favor, come around this side so they can see. Come over here and you do the exact same thing, guys. Now, remember what I told you about that little bitty fold you could do to create a nice little soft bumper there? Create a little bit of fold. Look, you see I have a little drip there. It's okay, a little drip is okay. Use the stocky net as your helper. Let it hold everything in place for you while you're working with the ace wraps. Bring the arm back up. If you don't mind, hold down there for me for just a sec. There you go. And here we go, everybody. Big hand, big hand. And let's start wrapping it up. Ace wraps are never tight. Ever, ever, never. Fold it in half, make it look nice and neat. You can cut a hole in the ace wrap if you want. Slant on down. Remember, the ace wrap is only there to hold the splint in place. It's not there to be tight at all. Okay. And then, go ahead and let go for me. If you're working alone, just have him rest his arm wherever it's comfortable. Give me a karate chop right there on the clavicle bone. There you go. Get your fingers, make a little indention here. You can make an indention and fold it, or you can put two slits in here and you can tuck the ends in. Either way is okay. So here we go. Remember that if we're suspecting that we're, we're suspecting an elbow injury, we want to make sure that the elbow is very, very well protected. So you're going to make it look like a box. You see how it's starting to look there? You want to make a box in that corner there to protect that elbow. Nice and easy, nice and easy. And then the last one, we're gonna finish it up. And this is gonna conclude in just a moment, it's gonna conclude part one of the video. Don't forget, stay tuned for part two, where that came out, but that's okay, because I'm gonna catch it with the ace wrap now. Part two, we're gonna we're gonna build on this. This posterior long arm we just did, we're going to build on it. We're going to do something really, really cool with it. And so then if you want to come around front. So as you're looking at it, you now have, you can make it look nice and neat for the video, you now have a posterior long arm, which you would of course put into a sling. So what happens is the doctor now comes in and he or she comes in and they say, you know what, you know what, that looks pretty good. That looks pretty good, I like that. But you know what, I think, I think it's not gonna be stable enough right here where the fracture is. So why don't we go ahead and leave this on and let's go ahead and do a sugar tong with it for extra support. That's gonna be part two of the video. We're gonna finish here with part one. I. I really, really would like for you to stay for part two because we're going to leave this on just like this and we're going to, right in part two, we're going to shift right into what we do with this and how we go from this to this plus a sugar tongue. Stay tuned.